In the name of our conquering hero, our rock and our castle, the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. I may be dating myself a bit, maybe not. I, I always have enjoyed music of the generation or two before me than the one of my own. Remember growing up, my parents had on an oldies 94.9 FM out of Madison, WOLX, or Star 95.7 out of Milwaukee, Milwaukee's oldies station. Music from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, that's just what I grew up listening to on Memorial Day weekend when they'd have people over. We had a little pool in our backyard, and that, that, that was the music, and I loved it. I enjoyed it. Remember first time hearing the song by the Eagles from the 70s, Hotel California? You know that one, right? And I was younger and impressionable at that age and thinking to myself as I heard the lyrics, that's got to be talking about hell. You listen to what it says. It talks about a, a man driving across the desert, coming to a place to stay for the night and uh, he, he says, I'm thinking to myself, this could be heaven or this could be hell. And when he finds himself running for the door to find the passage back to the place he was before, what is he told? You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. I remember thinking as a kid, wow, that's deep. You know, a lot deeper than some of the doo-wop, bebop of the 50s and 60s. This is, he's preaching something here. Well, come to find out later, after the age of the internet came upon us, that apparently that wasn't the intention of the Eagles with that song. They're quoted as saying, Hotel California is an allegory about materialism and greed in Southern California in the 70s. It presents California as a prison. The artists freely enter, only to discover they can't later escape. It's a metaphor for the West Coast music industry and its effect on talented musicians who find themselves ensnared in its glittering web. So I was talking about people who get wrapped up in their music and get into Hollywood, get into the music industry and can't ever seem to get out. It gets them in its clutches and they can't escape. But I'll tell you what, you listen to the lyrics, it may have, have well have been about hell. And you even hear their explanation to the song, it still may as well be about hell. Materialism and greed and caring about only yourself and separating yourself from God and what he wants only to do what you want. Call it a, call it a hotel people check into, a lavish looking place from the outside. Riches and fame and wealth and do whatever you want whenever you want and there's no consequences and just live life on your terms. That looks kind of nice. Once you check in, you find out it's a different story and you can never leave. And you know, we all were on the phone making reservations. We were on the internet finding the best rate. Ever since our first parents fell into sin, ever since they thought they knew better from God and we're going to live life on their terms instead of his and that he wasn't as loving as they thought he was, them and all their children after them were destined for that place. Again, as we said, the amenities on the outside maybe look very nice and appealing. You think about it. Think about having a vacation from God for a while. Because that's how it's advertised. Right? Here's the benefit. You don't have to worry about his rules. You don't have to tiptoe around people. You can say what you want to say whenever you want to say it. You can do what you want to do whenever you want to do it. No one's watching over you. It's all about you. Live it up. Eat, drink, and be merry. Don't worry about tomorrow. Just worry about today. Sounds kind of nice. But what it doesn't tell you there on the website or the travel agent on the phone, once you get there, it all changes. And there's no more sun coming up in the morning. There's no more love. There's no more friends or family. There's no more mercy. There's no more grace. There's no more comfort. There's no more peace. It's utter darkness and pain and separation from God forever. 
Well, who'd want to go there then? When you hear the real story, right? When you see behind the scenes and some of the reviews come in and only gave it one star, if not that, maybe half a star or zero stars. No one wants to be here. Don't ever come. Why would you ever want to go? And yet, think about it. How many times a day do we put ourselves before God and our neighbor? We can be so selfish. As if we're, we're back on the phone saying, we, we'd like a room. How many times a day do we, do we hurt people with our thoughts or our words or our actions? Hey, we, 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 we want one with all the amenities. Lacking forgiveness, lacking the love that Jesus commands us to have. How, how many times a day, how many times a week do we put someone between a husband and wife a third party comes, I was just thinking the thoughts, I was just flirting a little bit, it's not a big deal. How many times before someone's married, do they enjoy the blessings of marriage without being married? I'd like the honeymoon suite. How many times do we let greed take over and materialism? And Although we know Jesus says, seek first my kingdom and all those other things will be added unto you. They say, no, I don't take your word for it. I don't trust you. I'm going to seek first my kingdom. Give us the corner room, the penthouse suite. Well, one day, as the reservations were pouring in and the demon managers at the front desk and the bellhops were just jumping for joy, as they wink at each other and see that all these people who are coming here have no idea that once they get here they can never get out and just how terrible it's going to be and they're up there living their life thinking all is well. They'll see, they'll see. One day, a man walks in. Didn't look real special. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. In the past couple days before this, he hadn't said a whole lot as he stood before the high priest and Pontius Pilate. Even as he hung on a cross, we only have seven phrases that he uttered. But he had something to say now. And he walked in and he unplugged their computers. And he threw their desks upside down. And he pushed them out of the way. And he tore up all the reservations and he says, I have one thing to say to you. I won. I won, and you lost. And you will not take my people. This is not their home forever. They're coming with me. That's what we confess in the Apostles' Creed, in essence. He descended into hell in 1 Peter 3 tells us Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. In the NIV 11 we read today, he, he made proclamation. What did he do? Why did he go there? Well, his perfect life and innocent death was sufficient. God accepted his sacrifice on our behalf and declared us not guilty. And before he came out of the tomb on Easter morning for the Peter and John to see him, for those women to see him, he had somewhere he needed to go first. He went down to hell. Not to suffer. He did that on Good Friday, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's hell. And before he breathed his last, he said, it is finished. He paid for sin. He wasn't down there in hell to suffer for sin anymore. He was down there to announce a victory. He was down there to preach. And you say, well, preaching, doesn't that mean something good, right? Pastor's preaching. He's telling people about Jesus. Preaching just very literally means you have a message for someone. And what was his message? For those who are in hell, I'm the winner. The, the, the Easter hymn we sing, Jesus lives, the victory's won. Death and hell no longer can appall me. We don't need to be afraid of it. The odds may have seemed stacked against him as you looked on Good Friday. Certainly his disciples were afraid and were despairing. Remember the disciples on the road to Emmaus, even on Easter Sunday. We thought this was going to be the one. We thought he was the guy. 
We thought he was the Messiah, but now he's dead. And to the outside observer, it may have seemed like it was all over. Back about 2,500 years ago, some of you history buffs maybe remember the story of the Battle of Marathon. Uh, and in 490 BC, the Greeks and the Persians were fighting each other, and the Greeks won that battle. Kind of unexpected back in Athens. And a messenger named Pheidippides, so the legend goes, ran back to tell the people that the Greeks had beaten the Persians. And it was about 26 miles that he ran. And when he got there, I can say the legend says, his message, we have won, victory. And then he collapsed and died from exhaustion. So you think to yourself, now 2,500 years later, who in their right mind would say, there's a guy who ran 26 miles and then died. We should do that. Well, let's do that. and We'll call it a marathon. Uh, that sounds like a great idea. And since 1896, this has been part of the Olympics. 26.2 right? miles, people running. Steph and I did one. Uh, we did a half marathon. We've walked a couple marathons. The Walk Wisconsin here coming up in a couple weeks. We've done that a couple times. Um, and it's funny, as we were getting near the end, you're running past people who are literally <laughs> collapsed and they're holding different body parts. We get across the finish line, our toes are bleeding. We had not great socks or shoes on. Um, people are limping across the finish line. People are dehydrated and you just kind of look and you say, why did we do this again? For a t-shirt? <laughs> well, we paid to do this. We paid $50 to torture our body. Uh, I guess maybe the sense of accomplishment, you can put the little bumper sticker on your car, 26.2 or 13.1. Uh, maybe that's why. I mean, at least Pheidippides had a message, right? At least he had a purpose for running. And you think, well, today, well, why do we still do such things? We think of how Paul compares our life to a race. I mean, a really long run. You could call it a marathon, a whole lot more than 26 miles. And how grueling it is on our bodies, the results of sin, on our souls, the results of the devil and the world and our flesh constantly attacking us. It's tough. But we have a message in our hands. The message you heard on Easter Sunday, I know that my Redeemer lives as bleak as it looked for those Emmaus disciples, for the disciples who went to the tomb, for the women who were sad as they went there. Don't be afraid. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives, he lives, who once was dead. He lives my ever-living head. And he did it for me. And he did it for you. All those sins we talked about earlier, five, ten minutes ago. A wretch like me. And, and you say, Pastor, as you're, as you're saying those things, that wasn't me a long time ago. Some of those things were me just this morning. Does God really love me enough to take even that away? Because I knew better. And I did it anyway. He does. And he has. And don't let the devil, as much as he's going to try, convince you of anything otherwise. He's the accuser, right? The confirmation kids the other week. What, what does Satan mean? What does the devil mean? The devil, he's a liar. Satan, he's the adversary. He's the accuser. He's the prosecuting attorney. Always pointing his finger. Always trying to convince the judge and convince you, you don't deserve any of this. And you know, is he saying that to you? And if, if he stops, if he stops accusing you, if it comes to the point where you don't even really think about your sin anymore, maybe that's a problem too, because he's already convinced you that it's fine. Don't worry about it. If you stop saying, Lord, have mercy on me, for I have sinned, that might be a problem. And you might be back on the web checking in. Look back into his face and tell him, yeah, I have sinned. What of it? Because Jesus Christ never did. And remember what he told you, you old evil foe, you liar? You lost. I won. And because Jesus won, we won too. Our life is like a marathon. It's hard. It's grueling. So I hope we don't take that simple message for granted. The times you feel like you're ready to collapse. You're just done. You're ready to check out. You're done with work. You're done with school. You're done with your kids. You're done with your parents. You're done with it all. 
and you feel like there's no hope, and you feel like Jesus isn't there. Remember what he said in John 14? Yeah, I might be leaving you now, but I'm giving you something in return, the Holy Spirit, your advocate, your counselor. And like that teddy bear, like that blanket, he says he's going to hold me close into your heart. And he's going to remind you of the precious promises I've given you. And here today you have another opportunity. When you feel like you're ready to collapse, this is for you. Your sins are forgiven. And then you get up and you take that message and what do you do with it? You keep running toward the finish line. And maybe along the way you see friends and family who are about ready to collapse or have collapsed. What help can you give them? It's not a New York Times bestseller. It's not something they can find on television. It's the simple gospel that refreshes you too. Let's be honest. That's the only thing that fixes hearts and lives is Jesus. In the 1930s, so the story goes, a communist leader in Kiev was giving a lecture about atheism. And he stood up and he spoke for about an hour. You could say he preached, right? but his message was that there is no God. And by the end of the story, he looks at the crowd and he, he hoped to see their faith nothing but smoldering ashes as he gave his very impressive presentation of, of why Christianity is useless and there's no point in it. And he says, are there any questions? And the man stood up and he walked up next to this communist leader and he looked to the right and he looked to the left and he gave that famous Christian greeting, Christ is risen! And it says the crowd stood up and as one man announced, He is risen indeed! That's the message. Jesus descended into hell to proclaim his victory, to proclaim your victory. May that always be the peace and comfort for our souls and our purpose for being here to preach Jesus Christ. Amen.